Thank you, everybody, uh, and ho hello. Thanks for attending today's panel uh, discussion entitled Earth to CESA, uh, Connecting Earth and Planetary Sciences to Space Studies and Higher Education. So I have a prepared uh, introductory statement, and then uh, we have panelists. Uh, I'll be asking questions sort of in a round table format. Um, our audience, you'll be sort of a fly on the wall listening to our discussion, uh, and uh, you'll be able to uh, interject questions into Q&A or into the chat. So uh, my name is Dr. Christy Drexler, uh, full-time faculty at American Public University Systems, newly formed Space Studies and Earth Sciences Department. So I'll be your moderator today for the panel discussion for this one hour session. First, a little housekeeping just to confirm uh, um, your participation is definitely part of our plan today in our panel. Um, we want to invite you to ask any questions, make any comments that you'd like, and be an, an interactive member of this panel discussion. Uh, and we'll take breaks throughout the uh, panel, throughout this one hour session, so that uh, you can refresh any kind of questions that you have for us. Um, I want to thank uh, CISA for inviting us to speak with you today. And if you have any questions about today's panel or any topics discussed, uh, I'd like you to be invited to contact me directly. Um, Jim, I wonder, could you do me a favor? Could you type in my email address into the chat so people have that available? Thank sure. you. It's Chris, Kristen.Drexler at my campus. Um, so today we're gonna do a panel discussion or more of a round table discussion about earth sciences uh, in the field of space studies. So the question that we uh, proposed is, uh, can the multidisciplinary principles, hey Janet, I see you just said he hello to everybody in the chat. Uh, can the multidisciplinary principles of earth science, can those inform space studies and space exploration into the future? And how can higher education, we're all full-time faculty here on this panel, how can higher education integrate the intersections of earth sciences and space? Okay, so these are not small things. Um, so it's gonna be a kind of a cool discussion. Uh, we'll talk about hot topics, um, facing the planet, um, and we'll field audience questions and comments and suggestions and we hope this becomes an interactive panel discussion. So we'll begin with an introduction of our panelists and bring in several questions I have for them, plus, of course, your questions and comments. Um, but first, before I introduce the panelists for today's discussion, uh, let me tell you a bit about the context. Uh, we're talking about how Earth sciences can inform and relate to space studies and space exploration, uh, global and planetary changes to Earth environment, to Earth's environments. So for example, planetary geology, oceans, climate, biodiversity, environmental hazards, resource exploration, management, sustainability, including uh, humans and our relationship with the planet. All of these can inform space studies and our exploration and search for life on this and other solar systems and, and other space bodies. Um, but to do this, uh, we'll focus this hour on bringing it back down to earth. We're going to bring it down to earth. So our panelists are representing each of the four major planet sphere, planetary spheres, uh, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere. Um, and various people on the planet represent not just one, but multiples of these. And I'll explain here in a minute as I introduce to you the, the panelists for today. Um, of course, I want to I want to point out here that there are more uh, planetary spheres. There are up to 17, depending on who you ask. But the four basic big ones are the atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, and biosphere. So I'd like to introduce each of the panelists now. We have um, Dr. Lorenza Cooper, you can raise your hand. Uh, there he is. Um, Dr. Lorenza Cooper, he's an expert and teaches atmospheric sciences, uh, weather and climate. Dr. Cooper has a bachelor's in geography from Virginia Tech and meteorology from Florida State University. He also holds a doctor degree in atmospheric sciences from Howard University. Uh, as both uh, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, <clears throat> and a NASA research fellow 
He participated in field campaigns studying the behavior of nocturnal mesoscale convection systems, including the particularly high impacting June 29, 2012, Derecho, did I pronounce that right? Derecho? Derecho. Oh, Perfect. Right. <laughs> that, oh, great. That traveled over 600 miles from the Midwest to the Mid Atlantic United States. That's cool. Oh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, he's an active member of the American Meteorological Society, too. So, welcome, Dr. Cooper. Thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure to have you on our panel. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And we also have Dr. Denise Guest. Uh, she's an expert and teaches geology, geomorphology, earth systems history, and natural hazards. Dr. Guest has a master's in geology and remote sensing and a bachelor's um, in geology. She previously worked for a senior remote sensing scientist as a senior remote sensing scientist in support of NASA's educational outreach program. Very cool. Want to hear more about that? With over 20 years of experience in the GIS and remote sensing industry, also want to hear more about that, she works with a variety of lead remote sensing software companies such as Erdes, um, now Hexagonal Geospatial, and uh, Esri and Terrain Experts Inc., um, teaching scientists how to use the data collected by NASA satellites. Very cool. All You guys are all very cool. Um, she currently, I want to also add that she currently lives in New Orleans. It's a little damp there, I understand, <laughs> under a little bit of water. Okay. Uh, she has a, a daughter, two grandchildren, and two kittens in her spare time. She creates various forms of art and engages in river boating, gardening, and uh, wild crafting herbal medicines and tinctures. She also co-authored a book called Drink the Harvest, which is a guide for making and preserving homemade beverages. And uh, Denise, I wanna invite you to put uh, the Drink the Harvest uh, website, show your book, um, and welcome uh, back. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back again. <laughs> <laughs> there's a Facebook, just Drink the Harvest on Facebook and you'll find it. There's, okay. there's no active website, too busy. That's okay. Well, welcome, Dr. Guest. Uh, thank you for being on the panel today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and our final panelist, Dr. Jim Myers. Uh, Jim Myers is a, uh, an expert and teaches geography, GIS, and remote sensing. He studied natural resource management and human ecology as an undergraduate. He earned a PhD in geography from Rutgers University, where he studied landscape change and how it interacts with landscape preservation efforts. His research interests include GIS to improve conservation management efforts and to assess the environmental impacts of long-term long landscape change. He's worked with conservation environmentally oriented GIS for 25 years with positions in academia, government, nonprofit organizations as well. Um, this includes time spent with the New Jersey Endangered Non-Game Species Program and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, working on habitat ranking and land preservation, prioritizing projects of statewide importance. So on a more local level, he assisted local conservation organizations with their mapping and analysis needs. All of these are so cool. They're part of exactly what we want to, to talk to our panelists about. Uh, we want to learn more about each of these aspects of your biography. Um, Welcome, Dr. Myers. Uh, thank you for joining the panel today. It's a pleasure having you on this panel. Great to be here. Yay. All right. And I'm uh, Dr. Kristen Drexler, an uh, uh, expert in uh, human ecology. I teach uh, uh, environmental science, earth and planetary sustainability. I teach geography or systems history and conservation of natural resources. Uh, PhD in educational leadership with the research focus in socioecological systems sustainable agroecology and community education, uh, master's degree in international affairs and natural uh, resources management. So I want to welcome uh, all of the panelists. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here and thank you for participating in the discussion. Uh, from our bios, you can see some similarities, some professional parallels, geography for one, uh, NASA, space-based observation technology too. We can each demonstrate how dynamic earth systems and spheres impacts humans and other life on Earth, which in totality can inform and relate to space studies, space exploration, and our general understanding of how other planets and other space bodies work. So as faculties and faculty and educators, one critically important thing uh, that I like to impart on my students uh, is first and foremost, using the scientific method and understanding basic science laws, theories, and principles. So we have this in common 
uh, Earth and space, um, as well as understanding that Earth and planetary sciences is interdisciplinary and dynamic. It's changing, constantly being informed, adapting, um, and essentially that we as humans are part of and not apart from Earth's dynamic systems. And as such, we have a role to play in its integrity and sustainability. So unpacking these things, let's talk to our panelists. Focusing on Earth systems for this session um, and developing that as foundation can inform uh, and inspire hopefully some space uh, discussion. Um, so again, this will be an interactive discussion. Please chime in the chat um, and or Q&A and we'll check in for comments and questions periodically uh, so that you can engage with the panelists directly. So in this panel, we'll talk about some hot topics, the big things happening to our planet. We'll start with climate change, uh, to natural disasters, to anthropogenic landscape change, to human population growth, food insecurity, and more. So this panel discussion is not gonna tread lightly. We're gonna dive right in to some of the main uh, hot topics of our day, right? So finally, let's start with some questions. Dr. Cooper, we'll start with you. Um, and again, any, any panelists that want to chime in, have anything to add, please do so. Um, Dr. Cooper, we'll, we'll start off with a light question. Uh, how did you become interested and involved with climate science? Uh, what made you want to study this field, climate and atmospheric sciences? Okay, well, thank you for having me. And once again, good morning, I think to everyone, maybe someone's in the afternoon yet, but good morning for most of us. Um, so what's got me interested in climate? Uh, well, for me, it started with interest in weather and I've always had that interest. Um, my earliest memories was, was with weather, uh, running to the windows or to the door to see a thunderstorm or just see the wind blow. Um, extremely hard was always exciting. And one of my earliest memories was actually 32 years ago this week when um, Hurricane Hugo made landfall in South Carolina. At that time, it was um, the strongest hurricane to hit the United States. Obviously, we've had a slew of storms that have, um, you know, outpaced Hurricane Hugo. But to this day, it still remains the strongest landfalling hurricane in the state of South Carolina. And uh, I, I remember the, the power and the sound and the wind from that storm. And from there, I've just always had an interest. And ironically, as it is that I'm now a professor of meteorology, when I was enrolling into college, I had no idea meteorology was even a field that you can actually study. You know, at that time, most meteorologists on, on your local television station were simply anchors reading a script about today's high and low pressure. So I did not know it was like a real field that you could really dive into. So I said, what well, geography was the next best thing for me. And while I was um, at Virginia Tech in, geog in geography, um, the university was looking to expand into meteorology. So they offered a course, an introduction to meteorology course. And so I was one of the first students to enroll in that. And then separately, we had an opportunity to go storm chasing. Um, so I did everything I could do to prompt myself to get ready to go storm chasing because in my mind, I was a storm chaser at home, just running to the window, but now I had the opportunity and it was gonna be relatively safe. I mean, you know, the university was gonna have, weren't gonna be like a, a re timber where we're going inside the tornado. So it was gonna be a perfect opportunity, you know, to view nature's, you know, fascinating phenomenon safely. And um, I had the ability to do that. And from there, I was just hooked. At that point, I knew I could pursue further with meteorology. Um, I, after graduating, as you mentioned, I went to Florida State for meteorology, and then I came to Howard University for my doctoral in atmospheric science. And uh, that is where I got introduced to climate. Um, at Howard University, we have, there's a, a separate campus that is in Maryland. So it's actually strategically positioned about halfway between Washington, DC and Baltimore. Um, and being right there in the middle of a high urban traffic volume area, there was a lot of climate um, research being done, not just related to weather in terms of like humidity and temperature, but also other factors like uh, ozone and air pollution. And uh, I think we'll definitely get into further the discussion of that today as we look at climate change and other aspects of um, how our climate is adapting and changing. But that is a little snippet of how, about how I got into climate science. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that. If I, could add, 
yeah. just say something related to what Lorenza said. I find it fascinating that you you landed in geography you know, as a geographer, um, <laughs> but it, I don't think that many people realize the long-standing um, interest that geographers have had in climatology and, and the atmosphere. Um, and many climatologists, I think, actually get their start as geographers. The chair of my graduate department was the New Jersey State climatologist. Oh. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Jim, why don't you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into the, your field? Um, maps, basically. Uh, <laughs> I've always loved maps. Um, when I was an undergrad, um, they didn't feature prominently um, in my education. I got involved in uh, first computer science, and then I realized I wanted to go a completely different route um, and went into human ecology and natural resource management. Uh, at the time, in the 90s, um, geographic information systems, GIS, was first getting off the ground and, and seeing widespread adoption. Um, there were a, a lot of people who saw the potential for GIS, but there were a lot of people in the environmental field that were um, you know, still leery of computers and not necessarily comfortable with computers. Um, I myself wasn't one of them. I was comfortable with computers. Um, and my long standing love of maps um, came to the fore and I got involved in GIS in an environmental context that way as somebody who was willing to take the uh, domain specific knowledge that I had from natural resource management and human ecology and uh, work with GIS and the often frustrating um, early days uh, of uh, unrefined interfaces, let's put it that way. Um, and from there, I decided I wanted to finish my PhD. Um, geography was the natural choice at that point. Very good. You mentioned um, GIS. Just for the audience, what can you quickly explain what that is? Uh, geographic Information System, GIS, uh, is a, basically a computer application that allows us to create, store, manage, analyze, and display spatial data. Um, so basically, you know, it combines geographic data, such as, you know, imagine a, a map of the 50 states of the United States. Um, it allows us to combine that geographic data with attribute data about those states. Um, pop, could be population data, it could be any, any sort of data that we have uh, associated with each state. We can then not only just map that data, we can analyze that data spatially by looking at how nearby things might be similar to um, <clears throat> other nearby things rather than things farther away from them. Um, it, it's a whole suite of uh, analysis um, of, of different kinds of analysis that can really help inform us um, in really any diff any field you might imagine. There are applications of GIS um, for every field from business to the environment, um, you know, military, intelligence, uh, any field that you can think of can have a, a find a use for GIS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the the coolest things about it, it's very interdisciplinary, uh, very relevant to multiple fields, as you said. Um, it's, it's for the audience who doesn't know, uh, GIS is sort of layering information, layering data in a visual form uh, so that you can, I mean, imagine like several different types of, of data, population, soil type, I mean, you, you name it. Whatever you're looking for, you can layer this information and sort of target, um, look at a map and, and target an area. Uh, for management purposes or whatnot. Very cool. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, Dr. Guest, how about you? Uh, what made you first want to study geology and changing landforms and remote sensing? Can you talk to us a little bit about what that is too? Yes, I can. Let's see if I can remember what I was going to say. So about geology, it's, it's um, I always wanted to know why do things look like that? Why is that like that? And I was always picking up rocks. And when I got to college, geology was the first class that I actually understood. It's like, ooh, I can do this. I get this. And that was it. And I ended up in remote sensing in graduate school because my, uh, the department that I was in, they were very into, and this was back in the 80s when it was just Landsat data, 80 meter resolution. And um, so, to speak to remote sensing, re remote sensing um, provides the uh, 
raster data, which are like pixels, whereas the GIS deals with vector data, which are the lines. And so they've been married together. So when you go to Google Earth, you're seeing satellite layer upon layer of satellite imagery that have been collected by NASA satellites or um, commercial satellites over this past, oh gosh, was it been 30, 40 years? 50, believe it or not. Has it been 50? Well, I remember, I, you know, we, you know, struggling to get data and, and it was, it was a lot, it was a different, it was a different beast when I was in school, but we were, we were the pioneers. Um, but anyway, and um, so that's how I got into remote sensing. And we did a lot of geology with remote sensing. You can, you can understand what the mineral content of, a, of landscape is. You can actually do understand by understanding the vegetation, what soil types they prefer, even in an area like the Amazon or the Appalachian Mountains where it's heavily vegetated, you can still get a sense of the, of the shape of the underlying geology and the content through remote sensing or using satellite data. Any other Very questions? cool. Ah, yeah, that's good. Um, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to know what inspires people to become certain things or to study certain things. So, so that's interesting. Um, for me, I think it started young, um, uh, climbing trees, living in a place where uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, there are ponds and lizards and frogs and stuff to explore and to sort of wonder, to sort of ignite that curiosity and discovery. And then um, working in the national parks after that, you know, my, to start a professional career, um, I learned an appreciation for how things are connected. I learned about how humans are related to um, ecosystems and um and um, yeah, how, how things are connected and rely on each other, how we as humans are a part of uh, systems, earth systems and not apart from it. Um, so, um, so, so this is good. Thank you for that background. That's really important to know uh, where we're coming from, really what inspires and drives us. Um, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Guest, both of you have expand. I don't know, I, I, Dr. Myers, if you do as well, but both of you have direct experience um, working with NASA. Also, Dr. Cooper, you have uh, NOAA experience. Um, can you talk a little bit about those experiences? I mean, that, that's kind of large scope, right? Um, they are how, basically those experiences, how they relate to your expertise area. So uh, Dr. Cooper in atmospheric sciences and Dr. Guest in geological sciences. Um, yeah, what was that like? Um, can you describe a little bit about those experiences? Okay. All right. I'll go first. Um, it was, it was fun. I worked at Stennis Space Center down in Mississippi, which is just right across the bridge from New Orleans. And it was very interesting. I worked with the um, educational department and the earth sciences division, and they were putting up and making satellites like crazy pants back then, but nobody knew what to do with the data. And so my job was to educate other scientists and other fields on how to use, how to acquire, how to use this data, because a lot of it was free. And so, and we also worked with universities, there was grant money to be had. And so the, the recipients of the grant money would actually come to Stennis and we would mentor them for a summer. We would, we would put together a project and they would get, um, and this was for the graduate students and the senior, senior students and uh, forget, a variety of colleges and universities. And that was a lot of fun to inspire these young people using this incredibly cutting edge data. And, and of course the whole, the whole thing about being with NASA, it's like the same with Dr. Cooper for working for NOAA. I mean, it's, it's like, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so my experience occurred um, when I was in, in school pursuing my, my PhD. Um, as a NASA fellow for part of the time and then a NOAA fellow for the other, one of our major um, field campaigns, as I mentioned earlier, was the study within the Washington DC area. It was entitled Discover Air Quality. Um, and what the goal was is to capture um, how ozone at the surface was changing over a period of time. Um, I think we can all relate to, you know, there are certain areas in the country that have generally have poor air quality, particularly in the summer. And you have these air quality alerts that you may um, receive as a result of, of the um, amount of particles that are in the, in the atmosphere as well as ozone. So as part of this Discover AQ field campaign, um, 
it was a whole suite of agencies that was involved. There was aircraft um, for us as students at Howard University, we would launch um, ozo signs. So most people may have heard of like the radio signs or the weather balloons. So these are similar to a weather balloon. It's probably about twice the size of a weather balloon at the ground. Um, for purposes, it has to go much, much higher up into the atmosphere. This actually goes well into the stratosphere where you actually get the majority of your ozone. Um, and so we had this field campaign throughout the summer, I think, believe it was 2012, 2013, uh, we also did this in conjunction with um, satellite overpasses. So you really get to see how all aspects of earth science are, are um, interlocked there. In our particular area on the East Coast here, the satellites overpassed at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and 2 a.m. in the morning. So we were launching 2 p.m., 2 a.m. every day. Um, additionally, we would throw in some 6, um, 6 p.m., 6 a.m. launches as well. So it was all hands on deck. Um, field campaign. So it was it was really exciting. It was really exciting to be a part of collecting that data, to be at the forefront of, of when you start to process and post-process and then get actual, you know, information that you can make decisions or learn from. Mm -hmm. So cool. Um, it is amazing, isn't it? How, you, how we rely on this, this earth observation, the satellite data. Uh, to make informed and important decisions about what's happening here on on the ground. I mean, I um, I think you know, Jim, you have. Or, sorry, I'm just going to call you guys by your first names if that's okay. <laughs> Why not? Let's get informal. Uh, Jim, um, can you talk about that about space-based uh, Earth observation and and how it informs your understanding of how our planet works um, because that could possibly inform how other planets work, right? I mean, this, that's the whole idea. Um, I mean, so often space-based observations are used to track very important changes on the planet. Uh, so on a global scale, we're, we're talking about uh, some of those hot topics today. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with that or why you think that uh, that's important in your field? Sure, well, um... As uh, Denise alluded to, uh, we have now uh, going on 50 years of satellite data um, for covering Earth's entire surface. Uh, the first Landsat satellite launched in 1972. Um, and I would argue that that is probably the single most important data set we have for monitoring changes in the environment, both natural and human caused. Um, and I, I can't imagine trying to understand what's going on in the world today um, without satellite data. Um, mm -hmm. We need a global perspective and satellites are one of the best ways we have of getting that global perspective. Totally um, agree. Of, yeah, in terms mm -hmm. of my own work, um, I, I've made use of uh, satellite imagery um, for land cover mapping purposes and exploring landscape change. Um, and aerial photography too plays, plays a role here um, as well. Uh, remote sensing isn't just satellite data. Um, and I would argue that, uh, you know, really uh, any data that we collect from space um, and from uh, missions to other planets or to anywhere in the solar system is really a, a form of remote sensing. Um, we're not there. Um, we're relying on instruments that we build to gather the data remotely um, and send it back to us. So there's, uh, we have this long history now of, of studying the earth um, via satellite and, and other remote sources, um, that knowledge we can apply to studying other planets. Um, I don't know if we want to get into, you know, the idea of using Earth as an analog system. I mean, the, Earth is the only planet we have, right? It's the planet we know best, the planet that we're on. Um, and I, I feel like we can, we use Earth as a basis for understanding what's going on on other planets. We, we always think of Earth first and, and we look at planets uh, like Mars, is there tectonic activity? Um, you know, how is it similar to and different from Earth? You know, it's a you know compare and contrast um, essay question. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, like I said, remote sensing is the way that we get so much information about our planet um, that uh, hard to imagine <laughs> not having access to all that data. Right. Right, it provides a global perspective. Um, we see uh, we see changes that are occurring. We can find changes that have already occurred. Um, it's just a great it's a great uh, uh, means of finding data and informing ourselves about how to manage um, situations, uh, global scale situations as well as local scale. 
Um, so speaking of, let's just dive right into the, some of these hot topics I promised you guys we were talking about. Thank you all, by the way, for um, talking about your backgrounds and what inspires you. It's really important to understand what drives people, uh, their experience when they're on a panel like this, so that uh, we know where you're coming from when you're talking about um, hot topics like climate change and food insecurity and things of that sort. Um, so let's roll up our sleeves a little bit, switch gears and uh, dive into, um, let's, let's start with probably the hottest topic of the day, uh, climate change. So going right to Dr. Cooper again. Um, talk to us a bit about climate change, um, why it's important uh, on a planetary level, uh, how it impacts us and other life forms on the planet. Um, why, why, uh, why should we be concerned? Or okay. should we? Is that an assumption? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think your question already hits it on the head. We should be concerned because it impacts us all on the planet. Um, that, that impact is definitely going to vary based on where you are geographically on the planet. However, we know for certain that um, this change has impacts. For one, I think um, the general public has, I guess, been misled to believe that climate was at one point stagnant or that, you know, that nothing really ever evolved. And so the way things are now are the way things are supposed to be, or I could suppose in quotes, if you can see that, <laughs> are, are supposed to be. And unfortunately, that's just not the reality of our very dynamic planet. Our planet is constantly in motion, is constantly within change. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing now is that perhaps this change is accelerating at a rate faster than we anticipated. And as a result of that, um, it will require us to um, make adaptations and prepare um, and to address some of our vulnerabilities. And I think that um, what we see now in the, in the, I think the reason why it's so, uh, climate change is so uh, political and such in the spotlight is because it's really highlighting our vulnerabilities. Um, you don't have to even reach far back in memory to think about, um, you know, certain uh, results of climate change such as um, severe weather so the, obviously that's my, that's my um, area of, of interest. Um, and our panelist, Denise, I mean, she's, she's right in the midst of it lately, um, you know, with the one-two punch with these um, very large, very, tro um, very large tropical systems and being able to understand those. Uh, just Hurricane Ida, it's been, I think, two weeks now. Um, trying to understand one, you know, is the existence of Hurricane Ida a result of climate change? Uh, more than likely, no. Um, was the uh, the strength in which Hurricane Ida reached so rapidly? Um, that, on the other hand, is an area in which we believe could possibly have been influenced by climate change. Of course, more information and more data and more assessment needs to be made. We're only two weeks out <laughs> from this storm's existence. Um, but the fact that it uh, strengthened at a rate faster than we've ever seen from any other storm um, since satellite, uh, satellite observations um, suggests that, okay, perhaps something is happening, especially being that we're seeing certain things happen um, with greater frequency. So we're seeing greater frequency of these um, very large hurricanes that are intensifying rapidly. We're seeing more frequently um, high precipitation thunderstorm events um, or very large hailstorm events or droughts, uh, wildfires, you name them. Uh, whenever we start to see, um, you know, these seemingly events that should happen, you know, in once, a lifetime or once a generation, but there seems to be, you know, inching a little closer, that gap is closing very more slightly. The question is, what is this as a result of, of climate change? Um, I wouldn't say that the, the science is all there yet because it's not. We are um, generally, you know, at the very beginning of this, at least our understanding, as we mentioned, we only have 50 years worth of data on a planet that we believe is what billions of years old. So we are just in the beginning of this. And um, I think it's important that we don't get the misconception that we know exactly how everything is going to play out. Um, but we, we, you know, have just a total respect for the fact that there is much more information to learn um, on this on this very topic. 
Yeah, that's a good point. When you look at sort of the, the bigger picture, right, which is what we're doing, um, you're looking at the climate, the larger, the longer term climate. So think of the last ice age and 10,000 year cycles between ice ages. And uh, we're about 6,000 years into a 10,000 year cycle. So really we're headed toward an ice age, but really, I mean, it's another 4,000 years off. So we're not even talking about human years, right? We're talking about sort of geologic or astronomic time. Um, but shouldn't that even concern us more that we're seeing an acceleration during the time that humans have um, industrialized on the planet? So we, uh, the industrial revolution, seeing the climate um, uh, change accelerating, warming accelerating uh, at the time that humans um, have had um, have had this sort of impact from industrialization. Is that concerning? I and mean, I'll open that up to any of the panelists who want to talk, but yeah, Denise. I, I, I think it is concerning. And, it, and I would also like to drive home a point that uh, Lorenzo made is that the planet, the pla the, our climate has changed dramatically over the millennia, the life of this, this planet. You know, at one point it was in a big giant snow globe. There was nothing, there was no open water. It was all frozen. One time it was all covered in ocean, except for a few of the continents, you know, so it is very much sinusoidal and we are, we are about change, but yes, the fact that we are changing so dramatically, so quickly. Is there a way that I can share uh, a couple of pictures that I have? Uh, I went through not only Hurricane Ida, but I went through Hurricane Katrina too. And I'd just like to show, is that possible? Can we, can we share a screen? Uh, Tiffany, can she do that? Yes, there should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom that says share screen. And if you click that, it should give you permission. Oh, what happened? <laughs> ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so I want to share this and click that. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this was my house in Waveland, Mississippi before Katrina. All right, and see the, the little brick uh, brick underneath the porch there? Mm -hmm. Keep an eye on that. Okay, so how, okay, so now I wanna get another picture. How do I do that? I do new share and then keep there it. we go. I got yeah. it. Okay. What happened? Nothing yeah. happened. Oh my goodness. New yeah, share. that's a see it. Do you see the other? Yeah. The other? Yep, we see the brick. Oh, uh, I see share. Wow. I still don't see it. You're good, it's... we see it, Denise. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, so that was, yeah, that's my house. That's what I came home to. And it was very disappointing or discouraging. You know, when I made the decision to come back and move to New Orleans, I thought, oh, what are the chances that I would have to go through something like this again? And even though we didn't take a direct hit, it was still 150, 180 mile winds were hitting my house and I've got a lot of damage from it. And it's just, okay, we're all, everybody's rethinking about, well, if we're gonna be hit with one of these big things, every 15 years, you know, what's the point? <laughs> so, so anyway, so that's all I'm, I'm done sharing. <laughs> well, well, Denise, you, you bring up a, a, a great point because um, once again, this is showing our vulnerabilities. Like with Katrina, mm -hmm. you know, it was, you know, New Orleans vulnerability to the levees was completely exposed, right? Yeah. Anyone could see that, right? Then we had Ida, um, 15 years or so later, a stronger storm at the point of landfall, at least. Yes. We see the levees held up very well for those that were within the levee system. For those outside, they were still vulnerable. But then the, the electrical same. grid failed. So the levees, then, the levees held, the electricity and, failed. But and, and that was another vulnerability, which we saw in Texas this past winter um, in February. Um, and, and the question there was, well, you know, a little over a decade ago, Texas experienced a similar cold snap. Um, and, you know, companies were warned, okay, we need to address our vulnerabilities. We need to weatherize our systems because this isn't just a fluke. You know, we could potentially see this occur more frequently. However, the, the passion or the investment, the interest, investment interest just wasn't there. So nothing was done. And then we were left with what happened this year. And then you had many people um, it's funny because we address this in some of my classes and students who say, well, you know, the, te the Texas disaster was a result of Texas investment in green energy, like wind and solar, and those all failed. 
<laughs> um, without really having a, you know, a, a, a great understanding that that was, you know, woefully inaccurate. Um, because for one, as I try to stress in the course is that, you know, these technologies, solar power, wind, uh, wind power are used in areas much further north that experience these cold temperatures all the time. However, they, you know, they don't experience similar results as, you know, as a result of a cold snap. So it was just, you know, another example of our vulnerabilities and are we going to address these? Flash flooding is another one. You know, we see these horrible images of, I think Jim up near your area, New Jersey area, just what, well, after Hurricane Ida, I think even yesterday there were reports of, you know, people having been rescued from, you know, heavy rainfall from a thunderstorm. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, people it's died in my township um, wow. from flooding from Ida. Yeah. It was, it was horrible. It, rainfall rates that uh, reached three to four inches per hour. I mean, it, it's, it's nothing you could plan for. Can you, I mean, can you actually plan to deal with that much water um, entering a yeah. system? Yeah, that's, that's tough. And I, I believe I heard they said their system is only able to handle upwards to two inches an hour. So it was double, sometimes, you know, in some cases more than double its capacity. I'm not yeah, sure what a, you... A lot of places <laughs> are older suburbs. Um, there's, you know, towns in New Jersey, well, dating back to the 1700s, but areas that have been significantly developed since the uh, you know, mid 19th century. Um, and they certainly weren't planning for anything like that then. Um, and is, mm -hmm. is it even possible to retrofit areas like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm hearing all sorts of really interesting things. Um, dynamic systems, I'm hearing um, the interdisciplinary uh, issues, factors that uh, are part of this global scale issue that has local consequences. Uh, we were talking about uh, political or policy uh, we're talking about economic factors, planning, uh, management factors, um, development, population changes, movements of people, uh, vulnerability of humans and other life uh, to these types of storms and intensified storms. Um, what, uh, what do you think our part is in this global change, this uh, the global climate change, what is our role? What is, how can you identify what is anthropogenic or human caused climate change versus natural caused climate change? And the reason why I said natural is because I consider humans to be a natural part of the environment, but, uh, and as such, we have a role to play in its uh, integrity and, and sustainability. But, um, but I wanted to hear um, what you all thought about what is, What's the difference? Where do you draw the line between anthropogenic? What's our responsibility? Um, it, because it in, in overall makes us more vulnerable. Potentially our actions are making uh, uh, human survival in question and, um, and making us more vulnerable. So I wanted to hear what you thought about anthropogenic um, cause co climate change. Jim, we haven't heard from you for a while. How do you think this, uh, what is anthropogenic climate change? Well, it's obvious that we're changing the composition of the atmosphere by pumping lots of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. It's not just burning fossil fuels, it's landscape, changes in the landscape as well. Um, deforestation, um, for instance, can contribute <clears throat> to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, you know, and the thing is, that to me, it, it, it's, it's Measurable, it's observable. We have records for the past, uh, was it 70 years or so of, of greenhouse gas measurements? Um, and we know the amount of CO2 is increasing. We know the amount of methane is increasing. Um, so we can see that. Uh, and it's not just increasing a little bit, you know, since uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, we've gone from 280 parts per million or so, I believe, to now over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's not a small change, um, and it, it's clearly attributed to human activity. So uh, we can't deny that humans are having an impact on the atmosphere. Um, I think people think that you know there's there's no way we could possibly affect the atmosphere. It's so big, but you know, I, I think the evidence is pretty incontrovertible that we have had this effect. What the effects of those changes will be is, of course, uh, where the difficulty lies um, you know, predicting the effects. But uh, you mentioned survivability. Um, and I think 
uh, I would like to think that that would catch people's attention. Um, maybe saving species, saving ecosystems, saving the oceans um, might not, you know, actually matter to, to many people. But survivability of, if not humans as a species, survivability of uh, cultures or, or the current socioeconomic um, systems that we have now that we rely on, um, it, that should hopefully get people's attention. Um, and understanding that climate change could be happening quickly enough that we are not giving ourselves enough time to adapt to it um, and adapt in particular our uh, agricultural systems to climate change um, it, it is a very sobering thought. Speaking of uh, agriculture, um, I, I uh, attended back in 2012, I attended the International Eco Summit and I had a chance to talk to Dr. Jared Diamond. Um, Dr. Jared Diamond, some of you may know, uh, he's popular for guns, germs and steel. He's, um, <laughs> you, yeah, you guys know, uh, of course, you know, who doesn't know Jared Diamond? Um, I asked him in his opinion, what should students in environmental science and human ecology what should we be teaching students? What's the most pressing need on the planet today? And, and uh, he said food security, um, food security. Uh, what do you think he meant? Um, what, uh, why would food security be the big uh, global uh, issue, threat to the planet? Well, I can start um, because right now we supply it's supply and demand, it's truck lines, the, the, the food chain, once it's broken or collapses, there's gonna be massive amounts of starvation and pe things are gonna get ugly when people can't eat. Um, coming back from to New Orleans after two weeks about power, fortunately I had, I had left the area and coming back, I was expecting things to be a little bit more normal. And I was shocked to find out that there was still no gas at the gas station and there was still no groceries at the grocery store. It was, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had food. I brought a lot with me because I think, I think I like to eat. <laughs> I wasn't going to chance it, but that's the thing. It's the supply lines are going to break. And, you know, there'll be mass starvation and that's what we want to try to avoid. And, but we need to rethink how we look at our food. You know, that obviously industrial and large commercial farms are not viable anymore. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if we all just grew a few of our own vegetables or, or had co-op, we, we are so far removed from the sources of our food. It's just, it's almost criminal. Yeah. As, a, as a human being. And that was part of the reason that, you know, I wrote this, this, this book is because, you know, there are so many things, you don't have to go to the store to get juice, you can make your own juice mm -hmm. with surprising things, you know, it's just just little things like that. Um, yeah. Denise, I, I concur with you on that. Um, uh, one of the uh, assignments we do in, in uh, the class that I teach is uh, how to, uh, how to measure your carbon footprint and how you can impact your and lower your carbon footprint. Uh, and it's amazing. It's sort of an eye-opening thing for students. They're like, well, I'll do that today. Um, I could do that. I could do that today. And as it turns out, things, simple things like farmer's markets and growing your own mm -hmm. vegetables, what an impact that those decisions make, uh, a surprising impact. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, for, for example, farmer's markets, um, you have, it's kind of a triple benefit uh, not only are you um, you're buying locally, so you're reducing the amount of transportation that a certain food has to get mm -hmm. to you. Um, you are supporting a local farmer and local farmers uh, often, um, <clears throat> you know, everybody's farmers are struggling these days uh, and we have to support our farmers, those who feed us. Um, right. Especially the small farmers who mm -hmm. oftentimes use a polycrop system with lower inputs and oftentimes organic. Um, so that's, that's good too. Free range uh, cattle. There's all sorts of decisions that you as individuals can make that can over time have, uh, and in, you know, a lot of people do it, have exactly. an impact, <clears throat> more, yeah, than, I, more than local impact. Yeah. I vote with my dollars. You know, it's more expensive. It's more expensive, mm -hmm. but I'm getting higher quality food. There's less waste, less packaging. Like you said, less carbon footprint. Yep. Yeah, and it's amazing, you know, the young people, um, both uh, Dr. Guess, both you and Dr. Cooper uh, had a chance to be on a, um, 
on a the science talks uh, program that I did with the oh, fifth yeah. graders in California. And uh, we, talk, we talk about climate change, we talk about food security, we talk about um, responsible ways of, uh, of consumption um, and production and uh, really interesting stuff coming, coming from, from their heads. They, they, know, they know what to do. Uh, they kind of wonder why we don't do what we know we should do. But um, yeah, so the farmer's markets, free range cattle, composting. Remember, uh, Dr. Cooper, remember how they were trying to convince you to compost? How'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge here. It's, yeah. it's, it's not something Are you in a city? You, Are you in a city? I'm, I'm in the suburbs, uh -huh. but it's not something that, you know, HOAs want to deal with. It's not something that's readily available um, through our county waste. Even though I believe there's a way to do it, it's just you have to get the jump the hurdles. And, you know, most people aren't, yeah. you know, jumping the hurdles right now is not in the best interest of most people's yeah. time. So, <laughs> And here, here, I've, I've tried, I'm, I'm, this is the first place, the first, first place I've ever lived that I can't really have a garden because the soil is contaminated. Composting just brings rats. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, oh my goodness, you can't forage because like I said, all the soil is contaminated with lead. It's just, it's, it's the most inhospitable garden-wise area I've ever lived in, but mm -hmm. it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I want to shift gears a little bit. Astoundingly, we have about four minutes uh, till the bottom of the hour uh, and then another 10 minutes, but I wanted to keep it, um, I wanted to allow the, our, our audience to ask questions and in, engage with us. Um, so I did have a, I had about 20 other questions to ask. I mean, this, this sort of, um, uh, panel discussion or round table or brown bag even, uh, should, can and should really continue because these are good engaged discussions, um, from informed, uh, from informed folks who want to know more and learn more. Uh, so switching from climate change and food security, although there's a, we could talk for hours about those things, I want to sort of bring it back to, um, to how our studies of what's happening on earth today can inform and inspire spaced, uh, like earth observations and other space-based um, studies uh, and potentially um, space studies and space exploration. Does anybody have uh, any comment to that regard? That's a sort of a, a giant leap from what our, <laughs> what our other topics have been, well, but also rather, not, yeah. Well, rather simply, you know, the, the study of geology is the study of the earth, but actually it's, it's the study of any planet because geologic forces are the same on this planet, on Mars, on the moon, you know, you've got gravity, you've got sun, you've got, you know, moisture, you've got these chemical rocks and all of the, the, the landforms, the geomorphologies are the same. And that's why NASA likes to have uh, geologists on, in their space program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because we can look at something on a planet and go, oh, well, that was formed by X process. Right. No, that's a good, this is, this is a great point. It's not like I was saying before, it's not a huge uh, change in topic. It's right here. It's, it's mm -hmm. so why um, in terms of well, higher education, how, what should we as faculty be teaching our students in space studies and earth sciences in this newly formed, newly merged department? What do we need to be teaching all students in this department about earth sciences? Since we're all, we're all the down to earthers part of this department, as well as Dr. Janet Bader, who couldn't be with us today, but she's also a geological scientist and also uh, instrumental in this, uh, informing the earthers, the earth science uh, faculty in this department. What should every student in this department be learning about earth sciences uh, as it relates to and could potentially inspire uh, in terms of space studies. Well, I think we, more sorry, remote sensing. Yeah, people need, need to learn how to use that satellite imagery that Jim was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually um, I just helped a, a graduate student in the space studies program with uh, her master's project and she was looking at communication on Mars and factors that would uh, you know, inhibit communication in certain areas. And she was basically doing a GIS overlay analysis with multiple layers uh, of factors that would influence communication, figuring out 
um, where communication, where these factors would cause the most trouble um, <clears throat> and postulating ways to get around them. Um, you know, it's a direct correlate from how we're using GIS terrestrially. Um, I would also say that I think what we really need to do is to teach earth science as earth systems science um, and extend that to the idea of uh, planets as a system. Um, obviously all planets are going to be different. Um, all the factors may all be there, but they're going to be there in different ways. Um, but if we look at the planets as a system, as the system and the individual components of those systems, um, it gives us a chance to understand where those differences uh, are and, and how those differences are going to influence the, the development of their planets and the conditions that we find there. Good, so uh, multidisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary system studies of not just earth systems, but planetary systems in, in other, um, well, other space bodies too. Uh, Dr. Cooper, anything to add? Um, not really. I mean, you guys summed it up great. I, I really like what Jim said with the systems, and it really made me think about um, just the atmosphere in general. Um, for one, it's the one thing separating us from space. And so having an understanding of what's there it's, is uh, you know, essential. Additionally, um, Planets have their own atmosphere and they do vary significantly from that on the earth. And so being able to prepare for that and have an understanding of that is going to be critical if we're going to be, you know, landing probes on different planets and, you know, looking for life or geological features elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in studying, and you all are representing the four major spheres of the earth, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, hydrosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere. These studies um, in combination as a system, as Dr. Meyer suggests, as a system is important and can inform uh, space studies and space exploration. Um, thank you all for joining uh, the panel discussion today. Um, really appreciate your time and your expertise. I would like uh, to field some questions or comments from the audience now. Uh, we have about, I think about seven minutes, perhaps just five minutes. Um, and uh, I wanna invite you, if you have any questions or comments or think of anything further, uh, please uh, reach out, email, my email's in the chat. Uh, you're welcome to email me and I could forward your question on to any of the experts on the panel today. So with that, let me go ahead and switch over. Uh, Dr. Myers, any questions from the Q&A? Uh, there's nothing in the Q&A, no. There are a few okay. comments in the chat, um, but I don't see any um, questions that were posed. Okay, uh, let's see, what do we have in the chat here? Uh -huh. Okay, uh, oh yeah, so uh, Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller is an uh, astronomy professor in our same department. Um, uh, if you're still here, let's see, you're in Texas. Okay, we're talking about the storms in Texas. Companies did not prepare at all. There was no local government support for it. Um, if you look at the money, it would have been much more cost-effective to prepare. Very good uh, comment. It incorporates the multidisciplinary nature of uh, studying these types of earth systems. We're looking at not just the fact that they're happening and that we're vulnerable to it, but that we have a role in it in terms of our local governance, our economic support and our preparation and management of um, foreseeable and unforeseeable events uh, related to global conditions like climate change. Um, Curtis Archer, uh, you mentioned Jared Diamond, quite compelling, I agree. He wrote where he made a good argument that the farming and civilization was the greatest mistake in human history. Funny we were talking about him at a space conference. Yes, a big jump from the Stone Age to the stars. Really interesting. Do you mind if I use the Stone Age to the stars? I hope you don't mind, but I would really like to use the Stone Age to the stars um, yeah. as, a, <laughs> as a perhaps a, a module title or something. Um, because that's, I'm building a course on uh, earth and planetary uh, sustainability, and I really would like to use that Stone Age to the Stars as, as a means of contextualizing what it is that we're talking about, how Dr. Jared Diamond can actually um, impact our discussion on earth sciences and space studies. Yeah. Um, thank you for that comment. Uh, Tiffany, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. 
I was going to mention that, um, yeah, uh, Tiffany, our, our um, conference host, was kind enough to monitor the Whova app for us, and she did uh, find a question in there. Oh, great. Go ahead. Uh, and the, que the question is, what changes in human activity would most significantly help to improve climate change? Mm, Stop driving. driving. <laughs> um, yeah, Stop go ahead. Driving. I mean, when, when the COVID, when the pandemic, when everybody was, things were shut down across the whole planet and everybody stopped driving, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was, that was very significant. I think if we all just stopped driving or used cleaner energy, that would be the, the one thing. Okay. Yeah. So cleaner energy and industrial, uh, industrialization, yeah. for sure. Well, there were some short term, I would argue that there might be some negative long-term impacts from COVID, uh, in terms of environment. Um, but for sure, uh, short term, you can tell our satellites will, imagery will show us uh, the air pollution in uh, larger cities uh, drastically reduces um, from uh, industry shutting down during the, the pandemic uh, lockdown at the beginning. You're right. Sorry, Dr. Yeah. Cooper, you were saying. Oh, no, I was I was about to say the same thing. Yes. And it, it's going to be interesting because now a lot of that data is coming to the surface now that you know, we've moved a little bit beyond the, the pandemic. So it'll be interesting to see that. Um, once again, though, not to be confused with how that impacts like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, because that is still um, increasing despite the fact that we had record low mm -hmm. levels of emission last year. There is a lag in the atmosphere. And so we are still on the up and up as it relates to that. Right. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead, Jen. I was going to put in a plug for reforestation as a sort of short, medium term um, method for perhaps sequestering some carbon. Um, carbon sequestering technologies really haven't um, gotten to the point where they're particularly useful and who knows if they ever will be. Um, but, you know, uh, to the extent that reforestation is a technology, um, it's probably our best bet to remove some carbon from the atmosphere in the short, medium term um, while we get our act together and reduce emissions. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Also, one other plug um, uh, to the person who asked uh, ways in which an individual can make choices and behaviors to, uh, to have a positive impact, I would encourage you to Sorry, this is gonna this is gonna sound bad, but I, I think you should take my class, uh, environmental science class. Uh, there are eight assignments, uh, worksheets that you hey, love, Mr. all Mr. these Mr. students Mr. love. Yeah, um, and it 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 deals directly with how to reduce your carbon footprint, uh, what what you could be doing. Um, so each week we focus on exactly those things. So yes, shameless self promotion, um, <laughs> but but kudos kudos to uh, to folks in that department uh, in environmental science who uh, who um, who are right there um, uh, developing these materials and uh, engaging with their students to uh, to try to make a positive impact. So uh, thanks everybody. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, we'd love to come see you again and uh, and have a future discussion at any time. Uh, but. For today we appreciate your your time and engagement with us and thank you to the panelists uh, thank for you being kristen a part of this discussion. all right you did a great everybody. job thank you kristen all right, all right. Bye -bye. Take care, bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.